I'd just like to say, my name is Rachel Christofferson. I work for the Center for the Blue Economy. Welcome to the Environmental Justice and Sustainability Speaker Series, a student-led and organized series uh, co-hosted by the Center for the Blue Economy. Um, and we have interpreters tonight. So I, if you'd like to listen to this presentation in Chinese or Spanish, just click the interpretation icon on the bottom of your Zoom toolbar, select your language and channel and you would hear our speakers in Chinese or in Spanish. Um, and I will turn it over to Dr. Charles Lester uh, to introduce himself and our speakers. Great. Well, thank you, Rachel. Um, this is just a really great opportunity for us to uh, talk about this incredible uh, story. Um, but before we get into the discussion, let me just uh, set it up by saying, you know, this originally started as uh, part of uh, the opportunity I've had this fall to teach the sustainable coastal management class down at uh, Middlebury. And in thinking about what I wanted to present to the class, I you know, definitely wanted a section up about the issue of plastic. And so I started thinking about how to best do that uh, and thought having them watch the film and then get into some of the issues would be a really great way to do that. But then uh, I think it was Rachel's suggestion or somehow we got into the idea of, well, let's make this a community event. So. I was like, yeah, that's perfect. Uh, an, op an amazing opportunity to have this broader discussion and make it part of the sustainability series at MISS. So I really wanna thank you, Rachel, and also MISS and the Center for the Blue Economy for setting this up and making it easy to, to do. Um, you know, this issue for me is, is I'm, I'm old enough to have grown up in a, in a progressive place, Boulder, Colorado, that in the 70s was on the, you know, cutting edge of recycling. So when I, when I was a kid, it was all about recycling. And that was drummed into my brain and I became a, a true believer. Uh, but then, you know, over the couple of decades following, I just really watched this, this issue transform into this complicated or complex system of all of these things going on and, and then to see this film and some of the things that we're gonna get into that are presented there makes it, it's so much more than that upbringing I had about recycling and just really um, raises some fundamental questions about uh, what we have been doing and what we need to do going forward. So uh, I'm really pleased to see how many people we have here uh, to listen. And we have two great speakers to help us through this story. Uh, Steve Wilson, the one of the uh, co-directors and producer of the film, The Story of Plastic, is with us. We're so lucky to be able to have you tonight. And uh, he has been, I'm going to just gonna introduce both of you right now, and then we can get into the conversation. Uh, he has been um, active in this area for a long time, and he's an award-winning activist, a filmmaker, an educator. He's worked on uh, not only the on the art side and producing this incredible film, but also in the policy world and bringing forward uh, legislative ideas and programs. He's also been a researcher on this question. So we have somebody who has an incredible base of knowledge and experience to uh, talk to us about the issue. We also are fortunate to have Jackie Nunez here, who is the founder of The Last Plastic Straw. And now she's also the program manager for the Plastic Pollution Coalition. And I think I uh, first met you, Jackie, about five years ago, almost five years ago now, when uh, we were both uh, at an event getting recognized by Save Our Shores here in Santa Cruz. And um, I'm on the board of Save Our Shores now. And so one of the uh, angles I come at this issue is from that standpoint of trying to engage the citizens and the grassroots in all of these kinds of issues, including plastic pollution. And so Jackie's been very, um, active and instrumental and successful, I might add, in that uh, dimension of this problem. So I think we're going to have a very interesting question. I'm really happy we could get both of you to be here tonight. So I'm going to stop blabbing for now, and I think we'll pass it over to you, Stiv, to talk a little bit about, um, you know, 
how you came to make this film and what you experienced, your observations, and um, I'll hand it over. Go. Thanks, uh, Dr. Lester. Um, I really uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Big fan of your work and thank you so much for your contributions to this issue. Um, I know a lot of us on this call are grateful for your service to the ocean, um, ultimately. Uh, yeah, you know, like I have sort of been a jack of all trades in the plastic pollution space and just started uh, my career on this issue. I wasn't really an activist before. I started surfing and I saw plastic on a beach about 15, 20 years ago and started Googling it and writing about it. And that led me to an organization called Five Gyres, which hadn't been conceived at the time. It was sort of spinning out of a, another important organization called Algolita Marine Research and Education. And um, I was a journalist at the time and I wanted to get on board and I ended up sailing around the world and doing a, uh, you know, the first uh, plastic, the first global study of plastic pollution in the world's ocean. I, I was a co-author, I wasn't uh, the science director of that, it was Dr. Marcus Erickson, but helped facilitate the voyages and take samples all the way around the world to try and figure out how much was out there. And you know, one thing that led to is, you know, where is it coming from, and where is it, you know, where is this idea of a way, or in when we throw something away. So, um, I sort of set out to answer that, and I took a trip to the Philippines, and I was in a landfill called Smoky Mountain, where uh, people there uh, live in the landfill, and they mine it, um, they actually farm in it as well. Um, and they mine it for things they can sell. And I had this sort of stark realization that like, this is a way, this is the end of the road. And so um, ultimately I sort of vowed that day, uh, I took this photograph of a man holding a, a baby on his bare chest, a very, very, you know, this is a waste picker. This is an informal sector um, worker and, you know, working on a daily wage of probably one to two dollars, most US dollars a day, um, working six days a week. And I'm taking a picture of him with a $10,000 camera. And I saw this massive, disconnect in a very empirical way. And it made me understand like all of these thoughts and history lessons sort of came crashing in of colonialism and structural racism and um, predatory development. And it all came together in sort of one moment and I vowed to make this film. And since then, I uh, spent a lot of time in the Philippines and developed relationships and uh, with activists there. Um, some of the smartest activists in the world on waste live in that country. Um, we should listen to them more. Uh, and um, that sort of led me to meet a bunch of other folks in the sort of Southeast Asia, Asia Pacific region. And, you know, it's time, I've always been a writer and a creator and a creative thinker, um, but I wasn't a filmmaker. I mean, I actually find film incredibly tedious. Um, but writing to me is a lot more efficient and um, and it doesn't involve so much money. And, um, but, you know, to, to really get this story out in a way that was sort of non-sciencey, that was going to speak to the emotional nature of, of human beings um, was sort of the mission, but, but also to tell it from the perspective of those people who are the most affected by the pollution and also uh, people within those communities that have built the best strategies for combating it. And they were sort of different than what you hear at a lot of the global conferences on plastic pollution, whether it's our oceans or um, United Nations. Um, it just wasn't representative of the expertise that we kept coming across um, time and time again throughout Asia, Africa, South America. And so we wanted to settle the score uh, a little bit with this film uh, and really have it be uh, both emblematic of the entire system of plastic pollution from extraction to disposal, 
but also the breath, culture, and color of that movement as it truly is, which was way beyond sort of people concerned with the ocean as, you know, which was my sort of way or, or approach into it. So um, yeah, I it was the hardest thing I've ever done <laughs> by far. Uh, and the one thing I, you know, I can never really explain is what it was like all the stuff that didn't make it in the film was much harsher images than actually were in the film and the smells and the sounds um but also the resiliency you know which we really tried hard is you know the poorest dirtiest uh, top most toxic places in the world have children laughing and playing just like here and you have you know people are not miserable you have people who are living in it um but trying to you know make their way as best they can so um and just sort of a, as a nod to what I hope is to be a, a new world and a, in building back better in American society, I've decided to take um, this uh, panel tonight from a very special place. Um, yeah, it's beard right here, um, laughing, uh, laughing at, uh, well, I don't need to actually state my politics, but there you go. Thanks for having me. Um, it's glad to be here. Um, and I love working with Jackie, and I think you're going to tee her up next. Thanks. Sorry. It's a, uh, there's a little bit of a lag between me going to my mute button. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, that was great. Thank. We appreciate the backdrop for sure. Um, <laughs> I uh, got to go into uh, public relations or something. Um, our next speaker, Jackie, maybe you want to follow on that. I won't ask a, a question yet of any either of you, but um, you know, give us your introductory thoughts about uh, the film and and your experience in the in the issue. Yeah, well, I'll start with just a little bit about me and my experience and how I got involved. Um, I, I live here in Santa Cruz, right across the bay from you guys. I look over and uh, see Monterey on a good day, and actually, Steve's got some uh, history here too. He's he lived on and off in this area, so he knows the area well. Um, I came here over 21 years ago, and before that, I had lived in six different places, uh, or actually 12 different places by the time I moved here, and I was working seasonally. I'm a kayak guide and, and a um, river guide, former river guide, and landscaper. I was just kind of a jack of all trades, you know, similar to Stiv, just kind of going around and really wasn't much involved. I call myself a slacktivist turned activist. And, uh, but I got to, I got here and, and I was stayed in one place. And so I became a little bit more active. I volunteered for Save Our Shores, a local organization here, but it really was because, you know, I'd stopped one place and I really wasn't doing much. And, but I was seeing everywhere I went, uh, plastic pollution and it's exponential, especially in the last, you know, 10 to 15 years. And come to find out that's, that's, uh, by design and the production has gone up, you know, over, what is it, it was like over 50% of all plastics ever been made, it's been made in the last 15 years. So that was not a, you know, that was, we were seeing it. And I got to a point where I needed, I wanted to do more. So I volunteered for a local organization and started just like most people, like cleaning it up, you know, on the beach and learning about the issue. So I became involved with Save Our Shores. I did their sanctuary steward uh, training which was six weeks of intensive, you know, just every week we had another speaker. We had a lot of great people talk about the issue where it was just kind of an intensive download of, of all the problems, but also uh, training us to, to lead beach cleanup so we can educate the public. Um, you know, you know, part of my selectivist turns activist, one of my things too is I'm a pretty good uh, instigator and I don't like wasting time. And I got to a point where, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, cleaning up is great, but the analogy that we, we like to use is if there's a tap going on and we're just mopping it, mopping up the bathroom floor without turning off the tap. And I really wanted to turn off that tap. You know, cleanup is great. Last line of defense is a great way for people to see it and educate them. But I really wanted to do more. I wanted to turn off that tap and, um, and not just bail the teeth, the, the, the bathtub with a teaspoon, right? So, um, but I didn't know, I was just as overwhelmed as everybody else. And um, I've been picking up plastic straws. I was aware of them and I was saying no to straws on my own, 
uh, but it was it wasn't until I got served a, a glass of water with a straw in it and I was looking out at the Monterey Bay Marine Sanctuary. And I was going to all these talks. It was you know, 10, 11 years ago when there was a lot of data coming out. Actually, I listened to Stib sp speak a lot, um, by gyres, uh, uh, Captain Charles Moore, about all the stuff that we were finding you know, in the gyres and all the, all the plastic in the ocean. And I went to a national conference, the Plastic Gyre Symposium. And that's where I kind of put the seed out because I decided to I, when I had this aha moment to, to approach plastic straws. And the reason for that is because a lot of these talks, uh, the scientists were and the researchers were talking about the need for behavior change. And they were getting all this data and all this information out, but there really wasn't much behavior in, especially single use plastic, which they felt was pretty much the low hanging fruit and a good percentage of what they were seeing was a lot of packaging and, and to go stuff and, and a way to really kind of curtail it but they weren't seeing that happening. Um, I was witnessing it in my own life. I'd go do these beach cleanups and then we'd go out for a drink or something to eat and people were all sucking on straws. I'm like, didn't you just see what we just picked up? And I knew there was a disconnect and it was literally under their noses and they weren't really you know, <laughs> connecting those dots. But the minute I brought it to their attention, they were like, oh my God. And you could see the wheels going off and they're like, well, what else am I doing? And I really base this on that. I, I feel people don't set out to pollute the planet. We're just not aware. And, um, and that we needed an entry point, point in a way to, to engage people that was non-threatening, an easy way. But to me, that the plastic straw is really the poster child of useless single-use plastic. Um, when I got served that, that, that glass, I still didn't know how I was going to do it. It was when I got that glass of water and I didn't ask for a straw and it, it came with, it with a straw on it. And I saw at the time there was the Water's Precious campaign. I, I kept the, I stole it um, at the time because of the drought in California. And I'm like, that was my aha moment. I'm like, that's the least a restaurant can do is serve straws upon request. That's nothing off their back. And we're not asking them to do it. I mean, honestly, I joke around that it's the ultimate slacktivist campaign. We're asking you to do less, uh, less consumption, less waste. They don't have to buy anything. Um, but I knew it would be powerful and it'd get people talking about it because even if they were like, well, wait a minute, what? Then you know, it was a way in. Um, so I was, I started then yeah, about 11 years ago talking about the plastic straws as a way to do it. And, and at the time it was me and a nine-year-old, Milo Kress in uh, Vermont, be straw free. And he had this, um, what did he call it? It wasn't straws upon request he was advocating for. It was ask first policy. Now, a lot of my odd jobs that I did traveling and everything is bartending and waitressing. And I knew that, no, you don't ask that. That's how you upsell. And I'm not going to sit there. We, we are programmed not to refuse a gift, right? So when we go out and someone su suggests something like, would you like a straw? It's really hard to say no to that, to push back to it. Um, so I knew it was a, a matter of um, wants versus needs. And that the no ask, just like the Water's Precious campaign was a lot stronger. And I'd seen that happen. In the in California, so that's basically what I I uh, based it on, and that's kind of how it started. So just so you guys know, the the I, I call it kind of the seed that was planted in you know, a landscaper, um, but also like the pebble in the pond. And I felt like kind of the waves went out and coming, you know, pedal over in Vermont with Milo, and then with me, and now the waves are coming back twofold. Um, and so then fast forward, you know, to 2015, where the turtle video went viral. Um, there was a turtle with a straw stuck up its nose and that basically blew up my campaign. I mean, I was making headway. I had a website. There were other uh, people around the world. I had a lot of open source material. Kids were taking it on. Um, but when that happened, that was the straw felt around the world. And that was everyone's last plastic straw moment. And it pretty much blew up from there. Uh, and to, to, to this point about writing versus, um, you know, filmmaking, there is something to be said there. I remember talking about, cause I'm really, you know, from the beginning, I knew I was really constant about words and, and making sure that it was plastic and not the straw that I was against. It was the last plastic straw, not the last straw. It was a play on the last straw, but it was the last plastic straw. And, um, and to make sure that I was conscious of, of how I spoke about it, that I wasn't for a straw ban, I was against, you know, single use plastics. And really it was never really about the straw. It was about the gateway issue to the broader issue, right? So even, even when it blew up and even the bad press was good press because what it did is it made everyone speak about plastic. 
So I used to call it the gateway issue and now I'm kind of calling it like it's the key to the door, the door is wide open. Everyone's in the room, you know, you got to meet people where they are. So people are further along, so people aren't, but you know, everyone's in the room talking about plastic. And now I feel that our work's just really just begun, like to really, to make these changes that need to happen. And, and I know that it was a, it was a journey for Stiv to get this film made and it felt like tedious and forever, but I also feel like the timing is, is just perfect. And, and, and this is the story that needs to be told. It's like we are bringing people forward and they really need to see this and, and move forward. And then the, just this last week, so last week said so that the report came out, um, just kind of blowing it all away that, that's, you know, the, the source of all of this plastic pollution is really, which we've always known is, uh, you know, coming from the UK and the US was one of the main, main polluters and they've been, you know, what we sh they talk about in the film too, how they point to these um, global South countries and everything, the problems there and deflect it. Well, there's, it, it's just been you know, blown up. So, um, although it else felt probably like a struggle for Steve and for me to get the point across, I feel like it just happens. And, and one of the things in the middle of, of my campaign, I remember talking to a friend of mine who was an English ma major and talking about the importance of words and not to call, uh, to call plastics what they, they are. Plastic is toxic, plastic is pollution. Um, you know, it, it never was and never will be disposable. I'm not gonna use industry terms to sell the product like they've been doing for all these years. Uh, so I'm really kind of conscious of really you know, speaking about it in, in, in the terms of what they really are. Um, and my friend stopped me. She was a <laughs> professor of English and really good on words. And she's like, yeah, you know, liberals, we all, we kill people with data, you know, but, you know, people are, are storytellers and, and we're visual in nature too. So, um, you know, and that's one thing that the opposition has is they've got the, you know, the, the advertising dollars, they've got the visuals, they are selling a clean beach to sell their plastic, right? With their Coke and a smile or whatever. Um, they know that so they got the neuroscientists all working on it. Um, and, I, and I saw it in real time with the, the turtle video. Once that went, that was, that's what it took. That was the straw felt around the world that was like, oh, and people got it. Um, and I'm sure it's the same thing with the, with the story of plastic film now too. It's, it's really something that needs to be seen and a story that needs to be told. So I think it's perfect timing. Well, there's a lot there. Uh, I don't know if we have enough time to unpack all this. Um, you know, one of the reasons um, I enjoy this issue, to, you know, and in the sense of being a policy wonk, right, um, is because of all of the questions it brings up about the uh, what you said of changing behavior uh, and how do we, uh, as individuals, decide what to do or not, what, what shapes our behavior and what's our relationship to the system, which I think is a really uh, strong underlying theme in the film also. Um, so maybe before we get into the, the really big questions, you know, I alluded to at the beginning that I grew up in a place and at a time when recycling was the state of the art. And when I, the first time I saw the film and, you know, we were also, um, we, it was after uh, China had stopped taking plastic and the, all of the trash. Um, and I saw those scenes, you know, the landfill scenes. And all of a sudden this issue of um, recycling plastic was so much bigger and, and complex, but human. And I think that's, you know, what you started out saying, Steve, was uh, you know, highlighting some of that, the humanity embedded in this question. And so one of the things it did for me, and uh, you know, just being honest, it's like, I, I said, wow, I, what's the point of recycling? You know, why, I, you know, I was telling my wife that, you know, don't even bother like cleaning out the tuna can and putting it in that bag versus this bag. And so <clears throat> what, um, you know, how, how are we supposed to um, react or or can you talk a little bit about those scenes and and um, you know the what it means for recycling? I think both of you could speak to that also because you know Jack, you 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 were looking at the straw, this particular kind of plastic, and talking about um, telling a story or having an impact on not using 
the straw in the first place. That's not recycling either. So is, is recycling part of the picture? Well, I can jump in on that for sure. It is. I think, you know, the scenes you're seeing depicted in the film are a broken system and waste management is broken. Opening markets uh, in new countries is broken. Globalization is broken. Um, you know, there's so many themes that we touch upon in the film, but doesn't mean recycling is necessarily a bad thing. I think what you know look i grew up as a born skeptic i was a philosophy major i was a skateboarder listening to punk rock music in the 80s and you know was counterculture didn't had a serious problem with authority imagine that i became an activist um and i just never believed that you know the thing about recycling that i always found strange even from like the first day i got interested in this stuff was I understand how business works. And if the industry that doesn't recycle is promoting recycling as the solution, it's probably not the solution because if it actually worked, it would put that very mouthpiece out of business. So that was the sort of disconnect ultimately that, you know, made me skeptical uh, and, you know, I'm a famous contrarian, I'm skeptical of everything. But ultimately, you know, yes, like reusing the things that we create in this world is a really good idea. We have to fundamentally shift which materials we use because we don't want loss when those things are recycled. And we don't want, you know, if, if you make something out of toxic chemicals and you recycle it, if toxics go into it, toxins are going to come out of it. And so, you know, it's really about, yeah. It, it, I, and I think recycling in, in, the, in the real term includes reuse and reusability. You are, you, are, you, you are keeping something in a cycle rather than, and, and so I like recycle as a more active word than sort of how we understand it as you put it in a blue bin and then you read an advert advertisement on a grocery store shelf that says this is recycled. Um, I like the more active term is looking at the objects in our life and recycling them into our daily lives so as to push back on overall consumption. And so, yeah, I would say recycling is part of the, the, the answer, but it's not the panacea. And, you know, the, the solutions to this issue are silver buckshot they're not silver bullets and what i don't want to hear anymore is the narrative that recycling will save all so like one very small story which is sort of an outtake from the film so the scenes in indonesia where you're seeing people just walking through fields full of plastic what that is precisely is imported waste really low value plastics that have been flattened and they've been flattened by optical sorters from rich country uh, recycling facilities. So when you when you sort recyclables, um, if anything is flat, it determines that it's paper and, or cardboard. And so that goes off in a one side of the conveyor belt. And so if something is smashed, it will end up in that waste stream. And that will be you know, exported to places like Indonesia. And what waste pickers are looking for in there are flattened PET bottles, number one plastics, like water bottles, Coke bottles. They're looking for flattened aluminum cans. But there's tons of wrappers and you know, other plastic materials in there. And not all plastics are created equal. And the thing is, we produce so much and we're importing so much into Indonesia that waste pickers will only pick up the most valuable materials. And these are people making a dollar a day who are working nine hours. And, you know, they could potentially recycle another material, but they're going to make, you know, a tenth of what they make if they get aluminum or PET. And the reason it's okay for them to be to cherry pick this stuff is because five to seven trucks are coming every day. So they just wait for the next one to come. And it's not worth their time to go through, you know, uh, the low value plastics. So 
I think, you know, when we talk about recycling in general, yes, I'd like to say it's, it's part of the solution, but we're making too much plastic bottom line. It will nothing, no waste management system, including our own, you know, it may be relatively clean in the United States compared to these places we're looking, but let's not forget that we're exporting these materials to these countries. Um, you know, it's, it, it, it's ultimately going to be part of it, but it's, it's not, you know, the, the, the promise of uh, salvation that I think the industry has painted it to be. And they wouldn't if it was a threat to their bottom line. Right. <clears throat> Jackie, did you want to comment on that? You're, you're, uh, yeah. yeah, sorry, not the same problem. Um, no, I totally agree with everything Steve said. I mean, when I uh, first got into this, I really wanted to find out what was happening with plastic. And I took a three-day recology class over at the Ecology Center in uh, San Francisco, specifically to find out really what's happening with plastic. And at the time, there was a Stroman strike. This was before China stopped taking it, but there was a Stroman strike going on. So I'm there at the Ecology showing up every day. And... Um, you could see the bales just sitting there right at the dock and things were flying into the into the water and, and it was just all sitting there. So it was the, that visual. We're on the third day, it was after lunch, they still hadn't talked about plastic. And, and I realized why is because we did not have a handle on plastic. And they talked about the history of recycling and how, you know, paper and the and metals. And I really felt that the one thing that really uh, was an aha moment for me is when they talked about metals, when metals first came on the scene, the industrial age and how you know the, they polluted our rivers the, the skies were black it was just awful and they thought we would never recycle metals either right because there were so many different formulations to make these metals there was no regulation of how to you know so they didn't think they could ever take that back right until the war happened and then they were forced to streamline their processes so that we could take it back and actually recycle those metals to make our submarines or bullets whatever you know um, and I feel that that's kind of where, you know, plastics is too. It's like, they've never been really regulated and given, they, especially for single use, right? That to me, that's a crime. Um, uh, to, to actually really look at this, this um, material, like Steph said, to, to even recycle. I mean, that, that was just a farce. They, they wanted it to go one way, one way only. Um, you know, if you think about like that said in the film is that 99% of all plastics, you know, are derived from fossil fuel byproducts. I like to say, part of my truth of plastics talk to people is that it's the toxic waste byproduct of the petrochemical and gas industry is what's the feedstock of our plastic, right? So they've created a market for it and they're selling it back to us, right? They're toxic waste that they've got no, so there's no producer responsibility actually. They've just created this other market. And don't get me wrong, it's a great you know material in so many ways, my phone, everything. I mean, there's a lot of things we can use for it, but really not never made intention to um, just because of the false economy and the, the cheapness of it and, and the need to get <laughs> to make this market for it. They, they saw this, this cash cow and especially now like the film says, it's, it's even more so, right? At a time where they should be making a lot less of this, they're ramping up to make even more. It's like the last gasp of the petrochemical and gas industry. And I also learned that, so when we did finally talk about it, right? It was the one through seven resin codes, but I learned there's only, you know, over 21,000 different variations of those plastics. So those resin codes with, they're using their, you know, the universal symbol for recycling. And they claim they never meant to mislead the public. That that didn't mean it was, it can recycle, it was just to highlight the number so that you can look at that number and determine what resin code, you know, was gonna get the, the recycled in your community, right? So it's just great marketing and everything. And, and to me, it's like, how, how can they even use that symbol and get away with it? Um, I don't even know what's recycled anymore. Actually, I do know none of it is really, it never really fit the definition of recycling. It maybe got downcycled once at best at an abysmal rate. So um, yeah, and that's where we are. It, we've never really, you know, created this material to be recycled, like, like Steve said. So <clears throat> I think um, we have a question to, uh, lined up, right, Rachel? Um, yeah, yeah. So well. Yeah, Laurel, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask. I think it's a, a great question, uh, building on that segue you just gave us, uh, Jackie. And, um, you know, as context, you guys mentioned that uh, all of this plastic in the last, we've like doubled our plastic in the last 10 or 15 years. But the projections, as I understand it, are in another 20 years, we're going to double that production again, uh, which leads us to this question. Yeah. Can you hear me? 
Yeah. Yep. Um, so I should uh, introduce, I'm actually a mid-mom. Um, my daughter goes to Middlebury College and studying environmental science. So that's how I um, came into this, um, this uh, discussion. Um, I uh, also disclosure, I actually have a doctorate in polymer science and engineering, and I um, worked for the bad oil companies in plastics. So I have a background in that area. Um, and my whole career has actually, I always teach Courtney's that I, I want to work for the bad guys and make them better. So that's been my, um, my uh, 30 year career in, in the polymer industry. And I've been working on biodegradable, um, not bio-based, um, but bi truly biodegradable type plastics for the packaging industry. So I'm actually working with some venture capital people um, in that arena. So I thought your concept was really um, an interesting concept about turning off the spigot. And so my question, has to do with, um, you know, I've struggled with this, um, having lived on that side of the fence, um, on knowing the the drive toward profitability and the and the drive to push out more plastic um, and build more plants. And you know, it's a commodity business, so the bigger the plants, the better the margins. Um, so that's what kind of drives it. So the question is, 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 is what what do you think is going to change, you know, break the chain as I call it? Um, is it going to be the, uh, and I thought it was an interesting concept, this ERP, <clears throat> is, is that what's going to break the chain, which is the, you know, driving the Starbucks and the PepsiCo's and the Coca-Cola's to, you know, make them responsible for the end use that they, you know, if their brand is on that package, they're gonna have to live with that brand. Um, and be responsible for that brand, which will then cut back the, you know, cut the supply chain? Um, or is it going to be consumer um, with the, as you talked about the straws, is it going to be a consumer push to, to cut back the use of the plastics? I, I'm just trying to figure out how, how we break that chain and do it in a way that still meets the needs of, you know, the, the end consumer, which you know, for whatever their needs may, may be for, for materials usage? Or is it gonna be, you know, one of the areas I've worked in is, is paper straws. I've done a big project on paper straws, um, you know, to replace plastic, you know, what's gonna, what's your thoughts about what, what it will take to break the chain? So the short answer to the question is yes, it's gonna take all of that. Um, and, and this goes back to the sort of silver buckshot concept, but, there's a couple things, you know, with respect to, you know, where you work and, um, and your background, which, you know, I incredibly appreciate that perspective. There's a couple things that are, are pretty um, based in assumption. And I think is sort of how you laid out the case. And so um, without sort of trying to evade what the overall solution is, let me first unpack you know, how to look at it. And then let's talk about a, a solutions matrix. So first of all, our goal is not to substitute one thing for another. You know, whenever you start working in policy work, you know, the first thing that is said is, well, what is the readily available alternative that's not toxic? And I'm like, you know, and that's kind of like saying is like, well, where behind the bushes is the unicorn? You know, and so I, it's not that simple to just to say that. And I think if we go in the constant substitution realm, we're, we're missing the point. What we're trying to do is, is generate less waste by creating new modes of product uh, delivery systems. Where I think the most significant movement is going to come right now is, is, actually the pure economics of fossil fuel extraction in the United States right now. They're terrible. The fracking industry, which is the, the, you know, the biggest contributor to global feedstocks for plastics, mm -hmm. U.S. is the biggest uh, exporter of plastic feedstocks in the world. It's also um, a place where all the oil majors, multinational companies are looking to invest and build based on a rich um, 
you know, uh, shale gas formations all over the Gulf Coast, the Ohio River Valley, Appalachia, et cetera, um, and trying to capitalize on that. The problem is, is once you drill the well, it's profitable for one year. And then it produces about 50% of what it did before. So the margins are actually underwater. And the only way to make that industry work is to keep building new capital infrastructure so that you keep right. setting right. the clock back to one less than one year. So it's like a house of cards ultimately. And to some degree, it's, 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 it's an existential Ponzi scheme. And the oil and gas majors have enjoyed government subsidies for a really long time. And also, unbridled access to uh, venture capital and, 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 and ability to build these like massive, massive projects. Well, the bills are coming due right now. And you're watching some of the biggest gas, uh, oil and gas majors floundering right now. Um, so the pure economics in a, in a truly free market system like that's the thing is you you have politically you have these these companies arguing for unbridled unregulated capitalism when the only thing that's actually propping them up is regulated capitalism and subsidies which is mm -hmm. like so rich and ironic it's mm -hmm. laughable right. but you know most people can't you know come together with that so first of all i think we're going to see a lot of these things fall apart really quickly especially in covid um, right. And, uh, you know, likely the new administration, I, I do not believe that, you know, I, I believe in this election for as messed up it is, is, and I don't mean this to be over politically, uh, mean overly politically of an answer, is what we demonstrated is that the progressive arm of the left or liberal wing was willing to take one for the team and put up an establishment candidate to, to get rid of a, a broader adversary. Mm -hmm. And that sort of come to Jesus and kumbaya moment is going to be over January 21st. And so the squad, the sort of young leaders like AOC, um, they are going to be pushing a progressive green agenda and a just transition from fossil fuels. And I think if we start populating that idea of a just transition, we no longer create such a threat to the working class who are doing this stuff. And even to, um, sorry, I don't know your name offhand. Uh, uh, yeah, but it, it, it means your job is your same expertise is going to be applied to a different industry. And so mm -hmm. that's where I think the big movement is going to come at first. Um, and then, you know, all the narrative shifting work, um, you know, policy for policy to pass, there needs to be political will for political will to be created. There needs to be a shift in published con consciousness of how they perceive an issue. That is the narrative. And, in the activist community, we're sort of at odds with each other. We're like, is it individual uh, behavior change or is it policy and regulation? Mm -hmm. And I want to say yes to both. It's yes yeah. and. And so if we actually think of it as what we're trying to do is shift the narrative, both from a personal perspective to our relation to consumption and from a policy perspective, that's ultimately how we'll create transformative policies that win or the political will to do it. Because it's not that we lack the expertise in policy design, it's that we, we lack the ability to get that through the, uh, uh, to get that over the finish line. And one of the reasons in which we touch across in the film too, is there's too few people at the table. So there's a lot of people who care about the ocean, but they're very small comparatively to the, ex, you know, the, the, the rural parts of the United States or any other country for that matter. And so, you know, in the United States in particular, you have this rare and massive opportunity to marry these sort of coastal advocacy communities who are concerned primarily with water quality and, and biodiversity with uh, uh, environmental justice communities um, who are living next door to this stuff and are breathing stuff that's, you know, killing them. And if you can bring those two together and make that intersection happen so that at every committee hearing on a plastics bill 
it's not just concerned white women um, who drive Teslas testifying. And it's now people who are living in the shadow of refineries, people of color, people who have been marginalized, um, you know, by design. You know, the, the reason oil and gas majors cite these places in communities of color is by design, because they've been working for decades to stop political resiliency, to push back on that. So I don't mean, I, I really don't mean to be overly political in sort of how I frame this, but this is my ultimate analysis. And these are the questions we bring forward in the film. And we try and wrap it um, up in, um, in empathy. So we can actually you know, get to know these people who are experiencing this issue from different perspectives. But yes, ultimately, if polluters, if we can get policy passed where the people who cause pollution have to pay to clean it up or mitigate it or stop mm -hmm. it, it would force a massive redesign change from inception to product delivery. Yeah. Well, that's that's helpful. Thank thank you. I'd like to hear what um, Jackie thinks about this relationship or the a role of the individual versus uh, the system and turning off the tap. But before that, I also just want to. Uh, I'm a skeptic too, and so one of the things I would push back a little bit on. Um, is not that you're being political, but that if we look at our politics, even with what just happened, uh, maybe Georgia will go for the Democrats, right, and shift <laughs> that equation a bit. But we don't even have Medicare for all. We know how the system is beholden to corporate interests, special interests, and it doesn't really matter who shows up at the hearing if you've got these forces aligned in an entrenched uh, special interest committee driven system. So, you know, what is the hope really for uh, the politics of the fossil fuel industry to shift, even if the Democrats control everything for the next four years? I and mean, when we just saw, you know, Pennsylvania went for Biden partly because he said, oh, no, I'm not, I'm not shutting down fracking. So, uh, what, you know, what is your sense of, um, how likely it is that we would see significant movement on this fossil fuel question. I think it's not a matter of if, it's just when it has to happen. I mean, it's obsolete. It's not, it's, it's not even a sustainable um, or resilient way to go. It's just so extractful, ex extracting and wasteful. Like, you know, it, it's not good business, right? I mean, Stiv just laid it all out. I mean, it's they, it is not a good investment time and again, you know, we need to invest in these newer technologies and these better ways of doing things. I think COVID has done a great job of just exposing all that's not working with our systems, yeah. you know, um, in, in so many different levels. And um, I kind of have a, a similar background in the fact that I never really was political. I mean, I barely voted. I didn't believe in the system. Um, as a kid, when I found out about how our system worked, I just thought that's BS. And and for someone who loves being outdoors, um, when I was river guiding, it was like, you know, to me that the the environment is not political, right? We have the right to clean air, water, and soil. End of story. Like there's period. I mean, there's no. <laughs> it shouldn't be political, right? When we have the right to that. And, but if you politicize it, then that benefits the polluters. We can talk about it all day. Um, and so with all that said though, like this is the most I've ever like spoken to city council and showed up, you know, it's, it's one of those things that when I talk to kids, it's really important to use your voice. And if you think about it, I mean, politics is not action, it's the reaction to our action. And it's time for us to act right now. You know, what, you know the one, uh, quote I like to always give is Einstein's quote is like with the, the, the privilege of knowledge becomes the duty to act, right? So now we, you've seen this film, you, you're learning about the problem. Like, what are you going to do? And so, you know, it's just like what, what Steve said too, it is a buckshot. It's, it's all of the above. Um, you know, what can you do with your talents, you know, and, and whether it's music or art or, um, you know, using your voice or whatever it is that you, you want to do. Maybe it's not even plastics. I mean, there's a lot of things that, that this system is all wonky with that you want to put your efforts to, towards. But I really do see the power in that. And, um, uh, and people need to step up, show up, and speak up. 
and and I and I watch it time and again. Um, I do have faith, and so this is actually, believe it or not, even though the world is just super crazy right now, this is the the first time in my lifetime that I've wanted to participate and I have hope and know that, um, we can do better. And, um, so I'm That's where I'm going to put my energies and, you know, but you need to clean your own house before you can clean anyone else's. Right. So you got to look at yourself and, and that's kind of part of the journey. And, and what is your participation in there? What, where do you, are you going to draw the line? Are you going to continue to, you know, collect that paycheck from that job that you know is doing harm? Or whatever, like, what are you going to do? Whether it's, um, you know, how you speak up or what you do, and, and what are the actions you're going to take? Because you know, there is, this is it. You know, this is uh, we are at this this moment, and to me, it's a very exciting moment to be in because the sky's the limit, right? About this, to me, I, I it, it's like plastic, single-use plastic is design is a design flaw, right? It is actually pollution by design. We can redesign our future. It doesn't have to be that way, um, and we don't have to be so wasteful and listen. And so you would actually end up saving money anytime we go into these systems, right? When we look at these other uh, systems that that uh, Stib was talking about, um, where we're not even producing waste, it, it saves money time and again. And it's and it's not scarcity, right? People say, "Oh, well, don't take away my whatever Starbucks somebody use." You actually, it's, it's more abundant. You're using it, you know, good quality. Thing that's not full of toxins in your body, right? You just, it, it's the, 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 a lot of the systems, all the answers are going to be regional, right? I mean, how we, what we've done with our industrialized food system, I mean, it lacks nutrition. If you even call it food, right? What they're, what they're giving us and shipping to us. Mm -hmm. um, the, the bottle buyback, you know, problems and the deposits is, is what it used to be. We used to have the Coke guy come and the, and fill up the, 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 the um, glass bottles locally. Um, there's little things like that, that the money stays local and the solutions get fixed there. I think it's a lot of it's gotten so blown you know, out of our reach and it's, it's not a sustainable, resilient. And that's the thing too, like I'm actually catching myself saying sustainable. I'm, I really hate that word because I don't want to sustain the status quo. I want it to be resil resilient and, and regenerative. And believe it or not, when, uh, I think it was Walmart just made a big announcement and they used the word, you know, resilient and, and regenerative and looking at a closed loop system. Like that was promising to me for them to even use those words. Um, let's see if they do uh, and how they do it, but they're seeing the writing on the wall for them to even be in business. They got to be thinking out of the box and some of these closed loop systems to even survive and thrive. So. Okay. Um, I just want to say something really pointed to that, uh, Dr. Lester. So if I were to characterize your career, you're a man who has been beaten up for decades and also gotten some great policy wins. And why people admire you and your work is because of your resilience to, to even though you're getting kicked in the teeth most of the time, um, you're clever enough to get some things around the goalpost. And, and look, what, I'm, what I see at this moment in time is, I think this election and COVID is a reckoning. And I think we just have to, we have to bring the fight one more time and actually set aside our skepticism and our, um, our, you know, our lived experience as decade long activists who are putting forward bills and seeing the corruption every day and the disillusionment that comes along with it because if we don't, and, and like every environmental book written for the past 30 years, their last chapter is the time is now. If we don't band right. together as people, <laughs> like we will like, you know, but this is actually it because the credit, you can only not pay a credit card for so long before they come after you. And this is when mother earth is coming after us. So that's the motivation for me is, you know, I have, two infant baby girls um, and, you know, they are born in a post COVID world and uh, they're gonna fundamentally understand reality different than, than any of us on the Zoom conference are. But, you know, we need to, we, we actually do need to make the earth inhabitable. And this is our best shot yet because I think this election was both a referendum on Donald Trump and the left. 
and on the progressives because it wouldn't have been this close if it was purely Donald Trump. And so uh, we got people out to stop him, um, but not by much. So, um, and I think, you know, I, I think Biden and Harris are hearing that and um, time will tell, but um, if we don't pivot, everybody should, you know, just spend the rest of the time drinking good wine and watching sunsets, you know, frankly. Well, I don't disagree with that either. I'm, I was asked to be the moderator, so my questions <laughs> need to be somewhat moderate. Um, the, you know, on the getting things done, I do think this analogy of healthcare might be useful because, you know, we're still, many people are still fighting that uh, issue to move it even in a more progressive direction towards this, uh, you know, health insurance for everyone, um, financed by everyone. And Obama moved that needle, but I remember the day when they gave up the public option to get the deal done, right? And so we may be looking at similar dynamics over the next decade. Uh, we'll see. But I want to let, um, I know there are a couple other questions, maybe get one or two more in. Rachel, do you know who was next in yes. the list? Yeah, so it's uh, Will Finkel. If you, uh, Will, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and make a comment or question. And since we are so close on time, uh, I'm hoping that uh, there was a few other questions. That I, if our, our guests are willing to, let me pose those to them offline and, and get some feedback. That'd be great. But Will Finkel, you're up no. Hi there, um, my name's Will. Um, one of the rare 1989 undergrad uh, degree in French studies, way back Monterey Institute days. So, oh, fantastic! Yeah, I'm really <laughs> happy to be here and be part of this. Um, the movie was really inspiring to me. I loved it. I found it um, difficult to watch, um, sort of like the Attenborough movie. I don't know if anyone's seen that, but. Um, Sort of, it's just a lot to take in, but I'm so glad that there were some um, some real rays of hope at the end, and, and um, I found some real inspiration, ideas where I might take action, not just in my own house, but take it outside. So that's sort of my sort of my question is, uh, and you guys and you guys touched on this already, but yes, at home I can reduce, reuse, and um, decrease my demand in my small way, and try to get the word out to my friends and. Um, get the policy sort of out about changing demand, but I don't know how much that can affect supply. Like I, I failed economics, so that's not my, but um, how can we affect the policy from the consumer end? I don't know if that's, if that makes sense even to, um, you know, like if I go into my little community and try to start a zero waste initiative, does that get back to the producers where they're like, well, wow, we better change our ways too. I'm not even sure what my question is. Um, I refuse. That's interesting. I think I get you, Will. I mean, I think ultimately, you know, what you're bringing forward is, I think, one, a tone of disillusionment, um, and or or the what, you know, what, how does how do my individual actions matter? And you know, you've already taken a quantum leap, in my opinion, on how to even frame it or think about it. You're like, does my small um, collective political action in a given geography make a difference versus, you know, does my not taking a plastic bag make a difference? So you, you've already made the quantum step to political organizing. Um, so, you know, ultimately, I, there, was this, there was this meme that The Onion did um, a few years back, which I, I, this sort of concept had escaped me for so long and they always nail things in a way that I think is so prescient and, you know, so with the zeitgeist. And uh, they said, you know, uh, there, there was this meme that says, how bad for the environment is one plastic bottle? Um, Seven billion people want to know. And that's, that's exactly the disconnect I think we experience. So, in community, that's where political organizing occurs. And we are a very isolationist and individualist nation. But yes, the more we create community through political expression, the better the quality of our lives will be just existentially because people like to be around people who are doing good things. They just fundamentally do. Um, and there's 
tons of neuroscience on that and um, how we experience pleasure, how we experience um, safety, um, you know, as a species um, from the lizard brain side of ours. And also, you know, what we see is actual progress is, you know, a small zero waste initiative that catches in a community of 400 people that can be modeled to other communities of 400 people or 1000 people, and then the 1000 people figure out how to do it to the 5000. And it's all online and people are happy. Um, talking to each other and feel like they're a part of something bigger than them. That's it. You know, that is the elixir that um, evades us, uh, you know, in our political life. And it's been supplanted by a consumer culture that says, buy this to feel good, or, um, you know, is, is predatory on our vanity, or this idea that if I have, it's the keeping up with the Joneses, it's the new cards, the, um, but really, people who feel like they're a part of a community who are taking actions to make that community more resilient, time and time again in psychological studies have the best quality of life, regardless of riches or resources. Good answer. Um, Jackie, did you wanna uh, have any last comments here? I'm not sure, Rachel, what the protocol is for running over here. I don't wanna uh, overstay our welcome. Yeah, we're, we're, we're definitely a little over time, but I, I, it's up to our speakers and, and our guests here, so. No, I, I think, you know, uh, Steve nailed it, and I think you're onto something, Will. Um, I, it, you know, it really does start uh, in your communities, and that's where you can make the, the, the most difference, and then that's replicable. It goes, it goes out. So, I mean, I've seen it firsthand living here in Santa Cruz. We're actually looking at uh, implementing some reuse systems here. Um, as well across the bay. Uh, so yeah, you just gotta start somewhere. And, and I think that, that uh, we are tribal in nature. Um, that is how we share knowledge is through story and through community. Um, and I think we all do better when everyone's doing better. <laughs> so let's go on to the next all right. one. Um, I guess we better wrap it up there, Rachel, right? Okay. Um, I want to thank both of you guys for being here tonight. It was uh, really fabulous. And of course, the film is incredible. Uh, and the work you guys are doing on this issue is incredible. And I uh, wholeheartedly support you in continuing that work. And thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. Uh, and let's go out and make some tribal change, I guess. Yeah, and you know, feel free to share uh, my email if people want to ask any questions or anything. There's also yeah, yeah, there's cool. a lot of there's there's policy coming down the pike too. The Break free from plastic pollution act. Um, you know, when we talked about brand audits with uh, break free from plastic. That's going to be released soon, right? That they come up with that stuff. Has that been released yet? Yep. Sure. Yeah. The town's way. Yeah. So it just went. So yeah, peak plastic. Um, yes, yeah, so we can follow up on the discussion. Great. Thanks Thank all for showing much. up and I really appreciate the support for our film. Um, we are grateful to the response and glad it um, has been so useful um, for so many people. Thanks again. Thank you, especially with your new twins there. And, uh, you know, I'm sure that's challenging, so. Yep. They got, they got big shoes to fill. We named the two baby girls, we named them Ocean and Forest, so. There you go. Great. All right. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night. All right. Good night. Thank you. Thank you both.